Okay, so I'm going to take up just a minute um, before you comes and introduces Lana um, to talk about our career prep uh, mock interviews and resume reviews that's going on for all you students. So the link is right here. Um, you can also just Google it and it'll show up. We've got both mock interviews and a virtual resume fair. So we've partnered with professionals from all over to look at your guys' resumes and they're going to give you critiques. And then they're going to come in, those same professionals likely will come in for mock interviews. We'll have lunch afterwards. It's free. And you get to meet a lot of local professionals around here. So it's really um, beneficial for you, especially if you're getting close um, to graduation. So mock interviews are going to be Thursday, April 11th. Um, from 10 a.m. to about 12:30, the deadline to RSVP will be RSVP will be March 22nd, um, and you can find the RSVP at that link previously. Your virtual uh, resume fair is going to close March 8th, so get your resumes together, put them online. It takes less than five minutes. You literally just upload it, and we'll send it all off. They'll get the feedback, and we'll send it back to you so that you can implement the feedback. Um, if you want it so super simple and it'll be really valuable um, if you take the time even if you just have a very simple resume right you might be able to get some feedback on how to beef it up if you're not sure so um, last year's mock interviews were really successful uh, both the professionals and the students had great feedback so if you're available make sure you sign up we got the link there my email christina's email um, and the link again so that's all i have and then you you all i'll let you um, introduce Lana. Thanks, guys. Thank you, Jody. Yeah, I encourage students, especially who are looking for a job, participate in this mock interview and upload your resume so somebody can help you to improve that. So today, actually, we're so glad to have Lama with us and uh, Dr. Lama Alfashi. Uh, she's currently working his Hillsborough County as a planner and a focus on transportation, particular safety related to projects. Um, and also the projects relate to network connectivity and the greenhouse gas emission and the transportation. And I think, uh, you know, our Qatar uh, researchers actually are working together with Lama on multiple different projects. So thank you so much for supporting university research. And uh, Lama got her uh, doctor degree in intelligence transition system from Toronto, Canada. And he also uh, certified as a project management professional, PMP. And in, in her research, uh, Lama focused on the single and multi-objective eco-routing while using connected and automated vehicles. So previously, um, Lama worked with uh, Stantec before moving to Florida and worked for Manatee County as a transition planner. So I think today she will bring um, some topics on the greenhouse gas emissions, a model that she developed and could be used widely by the practitioners. So we are so glad to have you here you and looking much. forward to your presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you everyone for being here. It's my pleasure to present one of my favorite projects um, um, PhD. So the project is about prediction of greenhouse gas emissions in downtown Toronto using deep sequence learning. Just for your reference, this project was done in collaboration with the University of Toronto and it was published in the Transportation Research Part D Journal in 2020. Just for your reference, if you want to go back and check further details after we're done with this presentation. Um, in this presentation, I'm going to start with a brief overview on the objectives of the project, a brief literature review. Then I'll share with you the specifications of the traffic and emission simulators, case study, methodology, data collection, results and discussion, conclusion, and finally, suggested future work. Let's start with the overview. So there are two interesting facts that led and triggered the need for this research. So most of you, if not all of you, know that the transportation systems in Canada and in the U.S. contribute to the largest amount of the produced greenhouse gas emissions. The other interesting fact is that anticipatory routing has the potential to outperform myopic routing. When we say anticipatory routing, we mean that the coast on links is for a predicted time step instead of using the current or previous time step coast in myopic routing. 
Now let's move to the objectives. We had four objectives for this project. So the first one was development of a deep learning framework based on long short term memory LSTM to predict the greenhouse gas emission rate gram per second at link level at every minute in a highly congested urban network, which is downtown Toronto, while using microscopic data. The second objective was systematic analysis of the importance of various predictors that were adopted in the developed models. So this was a major goal of this project where we wanted to investigate and see what are the highly correlated predictors so we can predict greenhouse gas emission rates. Uh, the third objective was comparison of the results with two commonly used uh, predictive models that are the autoregressive integrated moving average, ARIMA, which is a statistic, a statistical model, and clustering, which is another machine learning model. Part of this objective was also to identify the pros and cons of every model. The fourth objective of this project was demonstration of the impact of systematically tuning uh, LSTM network. I'm going to share with you the results and I'll show you the impact of systematically tuning compared to manually tuning LSTM. Now let's move to the literature. Uh, based on a comprehensive literature that we conducted, we found a lot of studies about predicting greenhouse gas emissions at a highly aggregated level. In other words, spatially and temporally. In other words, we found a lot of studies where greenhouse gas emissions were predicted at the national level annually. This is good, but it's not suitable for dynamic applications such as routing that requires high, higher level of resolution for sure. Uh, we also found in the literature that greenhouse gas emissions were mainly predicted based on fuel and economic factors. And this is due to the aggregated level of prediction. We also found that ARIMA and clustering have been used to predict greenhouse gas emissions or uh, environmental pollutants at national level and other levels. The final interesting finding that also led, uh, led us throughout the process is that we found in the literature that neural network outperformed other predictive models. And that's why we chose LSTM as one of the uh, models to compare for prediction. Moving now, let's now move to the, specification, uh, the specifications of the traffic and emission simulators we use. So for dynamic applications such as routing, um, we required high resolution data. And that's why we used microscopic traffic simulator, which is the intelligent driver model to extract the second by second vehicular characteristics. Um, and in order to maintain the same level of resolution, we obtained the motor vehicle emission simulator moves, as maybe most of you know. Um, we employed it to estimate the second by second greenhouse gas emission uh, in a form of CO2 equivalent gram per second. Now let's take a closer look at the interaction or relationship between these two uh, simulators. So on the left side, as you can see here, these are the outputs from the traffic simulator, which is the intelligent driver model. So mainly what we got from it is acceleration, speed, and position for every vehicle at every second. Then what happens is uh, these two outputs are inputs for the emission simulator. So what happens uh, with the emission simulator, the first step is to estimate the vehicle specific power for every vehicle at every second using these two outcomes from the traffic simulator in addition to other factors that are rolling resistance factor, rotational resistance factor, aerodynamic drag factor, and vehicle mass based on the vehicle type, whether it's passenger, uh, passenger vehicle or passenger truck. After estimating the vehicle specific power of every second, we had to estimate the operating mode for every second at every second based on the vehicle specific power and acceleration and speed. After estimating the operating mode for every vehicle at every second, the model was able to estimate greenhouse gas emission for every vehicle at every second based on vehicle year make and vehicle type and the operating mode. So this is this, technical, this shows you the relationship between the two simulators uh, throughout the process. Let's move now to the specifications of the case study. So unlike most of the, a lot of studies that we found in the literature that adopted um, corridors on highways, we chose a highly complicated network, which is downtown Toronto, which is highly congested and it is associated with a high level of complexity. So our network is downtown Toronto that consists of 223 links and 76 centroids or not. Um, and with respect to the demand, we chose the morning peak period between 7.45 and 8 a.m., which is a highly congested period of the day. 
Let's move now to the methodology. Before I share with you the general steps of this project and the specific steps for every model, I would like to clarify two important points. So the first one is greenhouse gas emissions. Most of you know that it includes um, CO2, CH4 and N2O. Greenhouse gas emissions combined are more harmful to the environment than, greenhouse, than, than CO2 alone. And that's why we considered predicting greenhouse gas emission in the form of CO2 equivalent instead of CO2 alone. Because you will keep on seeing CO2 equivalent. Why did we choose that? This is the justification of why we chose CO2 equivalent. The reason is to include the other harmful pollutants, which are CH4 and N2O. Another point that I would like to clarify with you is that why are we predicting greenhouse gas emission rate gram per second? Like, why are we specifically looking at that variable for prediction? So the reason for that, uh, behind this statement, there was a lot of effort to investigate the best form of course when we route vehicle to minimize greenhouse gas emission. What we found is that the marginal cost is the optimal cost for um, estimating the traffic cost on links. What is the definition of marginal cost? So marginal cost is the best form of cost of at link level, and it represents the produced greenhouse gas emissions by one vehicle because of traversing a studied link. Now let's move to the general framework before I share with you the steps of every model. So the general framework, I'm going to remind you with uh, what I started sharing with you re related to the simulators. So it all started with the traffic simulator, second by second traffic simulator, extracting the vehicle characteristics, specifically speed, acceleration, and position. Then we use the outputs in the emission simulator to estimate the greenhouse gas emission rates second by second in the form of CO2 equivalent. After we extracted this data of the network, what we did is that we aggregated the data from one second to one minute. You will ask me, why did you aggregate the data to one minute? The reason for that is related to the characteristics of our network. So the longest link in the network in downtown Toronto is 450 meters. I'm sorry, I'm using metric, which is equivalent to 0 0.3 miles. And the speed, um, so to traverse this link uh, using free flow speed, the time is 0 0.8 minutes. That's why uh, we aggregated the data to one minute so we can um, get a relief of the extensive computational required power. So we aggregated the data into one minute, and when we aggregated, we aggregated it for all of the predictors, all of the included variables. So for speed, for density, for flow, for greenhouse gas emission, for delay, and other predictors. So after we aggregated the data, we come to a very important step in this research, which is the correlation analysis. We conducted an extensive correlation analysis for all of the possible predictors and greenhouse gas emission as a result. So this iteration, this process was very iterative. We kept on trying, and I will be sharing with you the results of this correlation analysis. Here there was a an iterative process where we um, where we chose or we selected different number of different sets of predictors and different number of sequences. When I say sequences, I'm referring to minutes. How many minutes of data are we going to be using? Is it three minutes before we predict the greenhouse gas emissions, or is it five minutes of data for those predictors to predict the greenhouse gas emission in the future minutes? So here there was an iterative process. We kept on trying different sets of predictors, different number of sequences uh, to predict greenhouse gas emission in a future time step using the three models, ARIMA, clustering, and LSTM. After we compared, we concluded and chose the best model. Now let's move to the detailed steps in every model. I'll start with ARIMA. ARIMA again is a, is a statistical model. Uh, the major limitation with ARIMA is it lacks the spatial dimension. It's not scalable. We had to develop a model for every link individually, and then we combine the results for four links in order to compare to the other predictive models. So this is the process for every link. So for every link, this is what we did. We divided the data into 80 to 20% respective, uh, sorry, um, training to validation respectively. What we did in the training set is that we had another iterative process here where we looked for the best uh, or optimal values of these parameters, autoregressive integrated moving average. There was an iterative process using performance indicators and other parameters to identify the optimal values. After we obtained the optimal model with parameters, 
we used it to predict out of sample using the 20% validation. Then we combined true versus estimated or true versus predicted for four links. And then finally, we compared with the other predictive models. Now let's move to clustering. What is clustering? Clustering is a machine learning algorithm where, where it technically it groups objects, where objects in one cluster are more related to each other than those in other clusters. It's a very powerful technique. That's why we wanted to see how it's going to perform with us. But before I start sharing with you the steps, there is a hidden step, which is identifying the optimal number of clusters. How do we do that? There is a very famous approach. It's called the elbow method. It's a, I'm going to be sharing the results and definition with it, of it later in a later slide. But I just wanted to share with you that there was a hidden step before this process, which is identifying the optimal number of clusters. So for every cluster, for every, cl every cluster, this is what we did. We divided the data into 80 to 20 training to testing respectively, as we did for ARIMA and as we're going to be doing for uh, LSTM. So for the training, 80% training, in order to avoid overfitting, which is a major problem with um, machine learning, we adopted 100 iterations of cross-validation. In these 100 iterations, what we did, in every iteration, this is what we did. We divided the data, <coughs> random assignment, 70 to 10% every iteration. And then what we did, we identified the optimal emission rate based on the least absolute value um, of the difference between true minus estimated. After we evaluated and we got the optimal emission rate, we used it on the 10% of the data. And then we repeated this process for 100 iterations. After 100 iterations, we got the optimal emission rate, and then we used it to predict on the 20% validation data set. After we predicted, we compared with the other models and concluded um, the results. So now let's move to the core of this um, research project, which is LSTM, the long short-term memory. So what we did here, uh, we divided the data similarly to 80 to 20 percent uh, training to validation or testing respectively. But here what we did, there were two stages for training. There was the manually tuning process and we had the systematically tuning and manually tuning fed the systematic tuning. I'll be explaining in, in more details. So what we did is that here we have the input layer. We chose two hidden layers in our network and you will see the results later. We, we analyzed the network using one hidden layer and two hidden layers. And what we did here, the manual tuning took, took really a good amount of time, a lot of time actually, when we did the manual tuning. Uh, I used Amazon Web Services and after like a period of time, we realized that Canada supports uh, cloud computing. So I had access to hundreds of instances on the cloud. I remember I used to run 20 instances at once as if you're running 20 computers at once. So it was really very um, uh, busy period at that time. So for manually tuning, what we did is that we tested a lot of scenarios choosing different number of predictors, different number of sequences, and different set of hyperparameters. We kept on trying till we reached a point of reasonable results. What we did after that, we shifted to the systematic tuning. Systematic tuning used Bayesian optimization in our approach. So what happens is after you, we did the manually tuning, we got pretty good values for the parameters. And what we did is that we gave Bayesian optimization ranges for those values to further optimize and give us a better value for those parameters. So what happened here in Bayesian, I remember I used to run it <coughs> different uh, periods. So one day, two days, three days. The longest period was four days on the cloud. I was like waiting, is it gonna happen? Is it gonna happen? Am I gonna get good results or better results? So this is how it worked. Simply, we trained manually. We got reasonably good results. We used those values of parameters. We gave ranges and fed them into the Bayesian optimization for systematic tuning. And I'll show you later the, um, the impact of systematically tuning the network. And then we tested and we compared manually tuning to systematically tuning. And this is something I'll share with you uh, in the results section. Now let's move to the data collection. This is a very important uh, important uh, element, and we know that sometimes it can be challenging from where are we going to get data. So what we did, 
The data is simulated for this project. So what we did, we had the end-to-end -end connected and automated vehicles distributed routing system where uh, we fed or we input the demand and uh, it generated data and we extract, it's a microscopic uh, model, and we extract the second by second vehicular and emission data. Um, this distributed routing system used connected and automated vehicles in addition to two types of communication, vehicle to infrastructure and infrastructure to infrastructure. Uh, with respect to the travel demand, we um, the, the, tra the uh, travel demand sorry was provided by the transportation tomorrow survey. So as you can see in the table here, what we did is that we generated many scenarios to generate different conditions in the network. So what we did is that we used different percentages of this demand of 2014 demand 70%, 100, 130, 150, and 200, and here is the associated number with every uh, scenario. And we use different departure time distributions to generate as many scenarios in the network as possible. Let's take a look at the number of data points we, we adopted for every model. So for ARIMA, we used uh, 66 and 17 data points for training to testing respectively. On the other hand, we used for clustering and LSTM training, the training and validation data set were uh, around 49,000 and 12,000 respectively. Let's take a quick look at the statistical analysis or of some of the important predictors and variables. As you can see, I'm sorry. As you can see here in this uh, diagram, we have the histogram or frequency diagram of speed. Speed is from 0 to 80 km per hour, which is 0 to 50 mile per, per hour. As you can see, uh, speed beyond 60, the frequency is pretty low, and uh, below, let's say, 20 or 30 is pretty low. And this has an impact, uh, had actually an impact on the prediction, and I'll share with you the results. Um, here we have also the frequency for flow vehicle per hour. Here we have the density per lane vehicle per kilometer, and we have greenhouse gas emission rate uh, gram per second in CO2 uh, equivalents. Now let's move to the results. This was the core of the research. Actually, every piece is important, but this part led the research in terms of what predictors should we use? What are the number? What is the optimal number of sequences? What are the highly correlated predictors? What are the unrelated uh, predictors? So let's take a look. I'm going to give you some time just to comprehend what is going on here. So these are the minutes, five minutes of data. So the aim of this diagram or process or stage is to assess the correlation between different predictors in the last five minutes with greenhouse gas emission rates at the sixth minute. So we wanted to analyze what is the optimal number of sequences and what are the optimal or the highly correlated predictors. These are the possible predictors that we chose from. So as you can see here, the correlation coefficient or absolute value of correlation coefficient increases from minute one to minute three as we're getting close to the time step of prediction, except for delay. And if we want to rank the highly correlated predictors in the last five minutes with greenhouse gas emission at the sixth minute, we can say that speed is number one, followed by greenhouse gas emission rate, number two, then we have density, number three, and then we have in link speed. So what is in link speed? We wanted, so the links in a network are connected spatially. So what we wanted here is we wanted to add a spatial dimension to our network. In other words, if we're analyzing a link, and another link adjacent to it, let's say this is the upstream and this is the analyzed link. So what happens on the upstream link at time t minus one dictates the condition on the studied link at time t. And that's why we wanted to assess the spatial impact on the network. So uh, one important note for you, when we predicted using data in the last five minutes, we didn't get very good results. And to be honest, this makes sense because in an urban network that is highly congested, changes are, are, or are highly captured in the closest minutes rather than the furthest minutes. So we found that the optimal number of sequences was three minutes. And this is what we adopted in the models and we compared to get uh, comparison results. Now let's move to the comparison. Again, I'll remind you, ARIMA lacks the spatial dimension. We had to develop a model for every link individually, and then we combine the results for true versus estimated for four links in order to compare with the other models. So here, as you can see, 
This is the, these are the, so the x-axis represents the true greenhouse gas emission rate equivalent, CO2 equivalent, uh, gram per second. On the y-axis, we have the predicted value, greenhouse gas emission rates in CO2 equivalent. Um, in terms of the performance indicators, we, we chose four performance indicators, which are really famous. We have the correlation coefficient, we have the fit to the linear curve, we have R square, and we have the root mean square error. So for this network or for this model, we used speed, density, and greenhouse gas emission rate in the last three minutes. Um, now let's move to the other model. Now we're um, illustrating the results for clustering. Clustering is a machine learning algorithm. And as I told you before uh, we applied the model, we had to identify the optimal number of clusters. And the, the approach to do that is a very famous approach. It's called the elbow method. Why it's called the elbow method, I'm going to explain. So this method is based on the sum of squared error value. In other words, it's the sum of distances between the points and the centroid of a uh, cluster. So uh, looking at this diagram, you may be wondering, what is the optimal number of clusters? The optimal is five. Why? because it's the point that is associated with the largest decrease in error. As you can see, comparing this reduction to this reduction, five clusters is the optimal number of clusters. However, we assess the impact of employing 10 and 15 clusters, which is here and here. Now let's move to the results. On the left side here, we have five clusters. Here we have 10 clusters. Here we have the results for 15 clusters. Again, on the x-axis, we have the true values. On the y-axis, we have the predicted values. And we have the same performance indicators, which are correlation coefficient, fit to the linear curve, r square, and root mean square error. The first thing to note in all of them is that the greenhouse gas emission rate was considered as a discrete variable, which is a major limitation, which contributed to either underestimating or overestimating the greenhouse gas emission rate. So what happens here, all of the values between, let's say, 2.5 to around 4 were either underestimated or overestimated. And this is absolutely unacceptable in dynamic applications such as routing. So as you can see, increasing the number of clusters improved all of the performance indicators. And specifically, if we look at the root mean squared error value here, you will see that it has been decreased from 0 0.4 to 0 0.3839, 0 0.38. So it is improving. And also compared to ARIMA, it's much better. Clustering performs much better, especially that clustering is scalable. We were able to develop a model for the whole network. <laughs> So um, this is what I have to share with you here in terms of understanding to help you understand what is going on and what are the limitations or drawbacks with using clustering. Let's now take a look at um, some specifications of the LSTM model and the results. So for the LSTM, we use two solvers, the stochastic gradient descent with momentum, SGDM, and the adaptive moment, uh, moment estimation ADAM methods. The considered hyperparameters include the initial learning rate, momentum, max epochs, learning rate drop factor, learning rate, uh, rate drop period, number of hidden units of the first LSTM layer, hidden layer, and number of hidden units of the second LSTM hidden layer. Before I start sharing with you the results, it's very important to note that to overcome the challenge of overfitting, what we did is that we used um, dropout layers. This is a very famous and effective technique in LSTM to use dropout layers. Now let's take a look at the results. So the first network, which was used for comparison purposes, we used the same number of sequences, which is three minutes, three minutes of data to predict the greenhouse gas emission in the fourth minute or in the future minute. Uh, we used also the same predictors, speed, density, and greenhouse gas emission in the last three minutes and for one layer, one hidden layer. So let's see the results. So on the right side here, we have the systematically tuned network using Bayesian optimization. And here we have the manually tuned network, which was done literally manually by changing different parameters and different um, sets of predictors and um, sequences. So as you can see, when we compare, the first thing to note here, if we compare systematically tuning to manually tuning, we see that there is improvement in terms of the whole performance indicators. And looking specifically at the root mean squared error, there is a 17% reduction 
in the systematically tuned network compared to manually tuning the network, which is really significant. When we look here, these are the true values. Here are the predicted values. Um, as you can see that the predicted values are more condensed, are closer to the um, um, central line here. Uh, the fit is much better. Um, and um, now we're going to be comparing, moving to the second network, which is um, pretty similar in terms of number of sequences, number of hidden layers. But what we did here is that we wanted to test the impact of including in-link speed. As you remember, I hope you can remember, in-link speed was among the top four highly correlated predictors to greenhouse gas emission in a future time step. So what we did here is that we considered in-link speed to see how the network is going to perform, how the spatial dimension is going to be adding value, or how is it going to perform. So when we added the in-link speed, we haven't noticed um, significant improvements. It gave relatively comparable results to LSTM1, but we chose to keep it just to add a flavor of the spatial dimension. When we compare here again, systematically tuning this network to manually tuning, we get pretty the same trend. All of the performance indicators have improved. More specifically, root mean squared error has improved by 16% compared to manually tuning the network. Now, what we did in the next step, we we use the same predictors, speed, density, greenhouse gas emission, and in-link speed for the last three sequences to predict a future step of C greenhouse gas emission rate a gram per second. Um, but we increased the depth or the number of hidden layers. What we did here is that we added a hidden layer to see the impact, because we've read a lot in the literature that adding or increasing the, the number of hidden layers will contribute positively to the accuracy of prediction. So as you can see here, systematically tuning absolutely outperform manually tuning. And as you can see as well, that um, um, the, the, the performance generally has improved compared to the other, uh, to the other networks. There's one important thing to note. You may ask, you may already have asked yourself why we see noise of prediction of values greater than four compared to values that are within this range. Why, why the noise is here greater? All of the networks. I can go back. The noise of prediction is more compared to the other range of, let's say, one to three. The reason is here. When we collected the data, we really wanted to investigate because it looked weird for us at the beginning. Like we wanted to know what is the reason. So when we looked at the statistical analysis here, let's take a look at the right side here, the diagram. As this is from the collected data, simulated data. As you can see here that emission rates gram per second greater than four, the frequency is pretty very low. And this high amount of, or high values of uh, greenhouse gas emission rate is associated with either low speed or high speed. And if you look at the frequency, you will see that it's really very low compared to the other values of speed. So this explains the noise you see here for values greater than four gram per second emission rate. Let's take a final look at the results and let's focus on the root mean squared error. So we started with ARIMA, which is a a statistical approach. This is the value of root mean squared error, and again, it lacks the spatial dimension. When we use clustering, as you can see, root mean squared error has been reduced from uh, ARIMA to five clusters, 10 clusters, and 15 clusters. And then when we started, we shifted to LSTM. As you can see, we can further see improvements. LSTM1, LSTM2, that included the in-link speed uh, to add the spatial flavor to the network. And finally, after adding one hidden layer, we got even further improvements. So this is the order in terms of the performance. And now let's conclude. So in conclusion, in this study, the LSTM1, which is the first network that we used to compare between uh, the LSTM and the other two models um, using speed, density, and greenhouse gas emission rate uh, of one hidden layer, which was systematically tuned using Bayesian optimization, outperformed the best case of cl clustering of 15 clusters and ARIMA. Um, we also found specifically that the root mean squared error of LSTM1, which was used for comparison, has improved by 37% and 3% compared to ARIMA and the best clustering model, respectively. 
Um, while LSTM can scale up to a network level and consider greenhouse gas emission as a continuous variable, ARIMA required a model for every link and clustering considered greenhouse gas emission rate as a discrete variable. Another reminder, ARIMA's major drawback is that it's not scalable. We had to develop a model for every link. And there is another drawback with it, that it's, it doesn't consider the nonlinearity between variables. Moving to clustering, the main limitation is that the predicted greenhouse gas emission in the form of CO2 equivalent gram per second was considered as a discrete variable, which affected the fit quality to the linear curve, straight curve, straight line. So after we predicted the greenhouse gas emission rates, what we did is that we predicted speed following the same methodology. We got better results. But the question, why? The reason for that is the relationship between speed and its predictors was more linear, closer to linear, compared to the relationship between greenhouse gas emission rate and its predictors, which was nonlinear and it was more challenging. So after we predicted the greenhouse gas emission rate, after we predicted speed, what we did, we applied single and multi-objective proactive routing to test and compare to reactive or myopic routing, and we got very good and promising results. Proactive routing using the predicted cost on links outperformed myopic or reactive routing. So this is the future. If we can predict, why are we still routing using the current minute cost? We can predict because we already have data. We can predict and we can be proactive for a more sustainable and uh, better performing transportation system. This paper has already been published. If you're interested, I can send you uh, the link or you can um, look up the name from the presentation. Suggested future work. So generating more data points that, that reflect the less captured conditions would contribute positively to the current outcome as you might have noticed. Dedicating more time for the Bayesian optimization process to tune the LSTM hyperparameters may contribute to, to higher level of um, resolution or accuracy. Developing predictive models of highways and expanding the study area is going to be beneficial to the literature. Applying the developed predictive models while utilizing real data is of high importance. I wish I had real data. But at that time, I didn't have wanted to do the research, so we simulated the data and we used it for predicting the models, developing, sorry, the models. And here are the references. Thank you for listening, and I'm ready for your questions. Thank you, Lama. Uh, I'm an assistant professor here working on mobility. Thanks. Uh, uh, thanks for the nice presentation. I know you're working on the prediction problem of the emissions, but the whole presentation uh, sounds like more of a traffic prediction problem to me, maybe due to my own uh, unique perspective. So the reason I think about this way is that the moves model, as you mentioned in the beginning, it basically tells us this, as a function that maps speed acceleration to emissions. So if we don't touch the moves model, all we need to know is the speed and the acceleration of vehicles. So we can, uh, based on that, we can get everything we, we want to know about emissions and, uh, uh, and the energies here. So then come back to the problem, we want to predict the emissions in the future. So that will boil down the same problem that we want to predict the trajectory, the speed and accelerations in the future. Then we can apply moves model. Then we can calculate the emissions, right? So that is basically uh, uh, my question here. So if we have a good traffic prediction model that allows us to predict the vehicle trajectories in a macroscopic level that can be the input of the moves model, so are we finished the job or we need something more, uh, something from your research here? I have, thank you, very, very interesting question. So I have a very clear answer for you. So when we predicted there was an associated error, right? Yeah. And also with my model, there is an associated error. What we're doing is that we're trying to eliminate a step of error so we don't have cumulated error. 
when we predict, because when you predict greenhouse gas, when you predict greenhouse gas emission from the predicted speed and acceleration, accelerate, predicting acceleration can be challenging, can be challenging. Yeah. I know it's related to speed, but still it can be challenging. So what we tried here is to eliminate a step so we minimize the risk in a way or another. And to be honest, when you, when you see the methodology, it's an eye opening to many problems. Once you know the relationship between the predictors and the, the variable you want to predict, your understanding is going to get better. It's going to really help you choose the proper approach. So we wanted to show the capabilities of predicting a very complicated variable, which is the greenhouse gas emission. As I told you, all of the studies that are in the literature, they predict the greenhouse gas emission at an aggregated level, especially and temporarily. So what you're saying, predict speed and acceleration and then plug the values in move and then estimate emissions, right? But still predicting speed and acceleration is associated with error. And then using these values to predict greenhouse gas emission or use it in moves also is associated with um, a small margin of errors. So that's why we wanted to eliminate and directly predict the greenhouse gas emissions from the highly correlated predictors. Yeah, thank you for your answer. Also from my perspective or, or the perspective of traffic flow theory, we don't think it's realistic to predict accelerations. Since that highly specific to the car falling model you use, people drive differently exactly. in different locations, different cities. So my question is that why don't we start from mesoscopic models? We, we forget about the detailed accelerations of vehicles. We have the traffic states, we can use the density and the speed. Say we treat the small segment of the road as a sail. At least we can know the speed of the sail. So what if we totally ignore the acceleration in the moves model here? We just see the impact, the significance of speed. And I saw the slide on the correlation. We analyzed the correlation between the predictors and the and your final outcomes. There we go. You can see the speed is the most significant component here. Actually, uh, I think we don't need a uh, density of flow here. Maybe, maybe, or we can just put density here since density tells us everything. Density tells gives you the speed and the flow. And I don't see accelerations here, so it's fine. So, yeah, my question is that, uh, well, what if we start from a mesoscopic traffic flow model, like a cell, cell transmission model, and or in your IDM model, we assume the vehicle acceleration is infinite. Vehicle can just achieve their desired speed with no time. So I'm very curious what will happen if we only have speed or we have a carefully model with infinite accelerations. How will that uh, affect the outcome, the prediction performance? Very interesting. So my answer to this is that maybe what you're suggesting is very good for a highway corridor because changes in speed are not as frequent and as dynamic and as um, in terms of the level of resolution, it's not comparable to an urban area. So in a very, I wonder if you visited uh, Toronto or New York, the dynamic changes in terms of speed and acceleration are significant. And the links are very, very short. I'm telling you the longest link is about 0 0.3 miles. What you're saying is suitable, great fit for corridors on highways. But when you're talking about a highly congested urban network with a high level of resolution and complexity, I don't think it's going to work. I don't think you're going to get good results compared to a microscopic model, uh, aggregating the data from one second to one minute, because one minute is the optimal. We tested two minutes. We tested three seconds. We tested different sequences. So think about it. It's about the complexity of your case study. It's not only the concept is absolutely right. And I'm telling you, it's perfect, and this is really very smart, but I feel, as a researcher, I feel it's more suitable for high highway corridors of less dynamic changes in terms of speed and other attributes. Excellent. Thank you for your answer. Thanks. Absolutely. Thank you for the question. Hi, uh, um, this is Professor of Behavior and Forecasting, I guess. Um, I get a question, a few questions. Um, oh, so, or you can tell me if I didn't think, didn't understand this right. So I, I feel like you created a simulated system of downtown ta ta Toronto, and then you ran it through a machine learning model to get out 
to try to get the output out of the, I guess the 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 end the end part was the moves gives you some greenhouse gas emissions. Yeah. Um. Okay. Uh, I had a few. I guess a few. Oh yeah. I still, that wasn't the question. But yeah. Um. So why did you have to test the Remo on each link? Right? Couldn't you have put in like the length of a link as like a a factor or something? Like why do you have to test it on each link? I didn't understand why you, that one has to be done differently than the others. Yeah, so the thing I remember when we started working in, on ARIMA, so the specifications on every link are different. So you can't really take the data, plug it in and generate or use the model. In our case, I don't know why it didn't work. Um, and the, the thing is that we knew that ARIMA is not the best model. So we didn't put so much effort. We knew it's not because it's not scalable, like in a way or another, it's not scalable. Uh, but I'm I'm still not following how it's not scalable. I'm like, you, so... Your traffic simulator, right, just just says like, okay, um, this link has, ha, you know, it's gonna interact. There are these interactions here on this link between the vehicles and the, you know, the signals. So, um, I guess I could see how you could say like, well, you know, this this particular link because there's three downstream signals, it, it's gonna act differently than some of the others. But you could, could incorporate that aspect into the Arima. So I feel like the Arima could have actually became better. Not better than the others per se, but it could have been. You, you could have maybe, a better arena. Maybe, maybe there are different and perspectives. Have, and yeah. you could have tested it on more data. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, it can be. Okay, uh, I guess the other one was. I, I I guess I didn't really feel like I didn't I don't understand like how important is this practically? Like how much better? I mean, how much emissions can you save by having a better prediction of? The emissions that paper has been published. I'm oh. going to be sharing a link with you. It was uh, applied on the same network, downtown Toronto. We used a demand uh, level. We applied it and we compared between proactively routing and reactively routing vehicles from their origin, origins to their destinations. So the paper is published. Cool. Yeah, you can feel free to check the results. Okay, uh, thanks. Absolutely. Thank you for your questions. Thank you. Thank you for the presentation. So uh, in the engineering, I think all the fields was to cut down the carbon dioxide footprint and to pursue a more eco-friendly development. And my question is, for your study, what do you want to see that most benefit the government plan planners or the uh, industry or for the reality of the industry side? What do you want to see the most beneficial part? Okay. So have you noticed when you open your um, Google Maps, when you go, you see the leaf, the echo route, right? So I, I humbly am saying I'm a bit ahead of Google. Google, ha Google Maps has a lot of data. They can generate predictive models following this approach or other approaches. They have a lot of data. They can generate or use or develop models to predict the cost and compare compare it to what they have what we have currently so the way i see it is that this research is eye opening not to governments but to maybe the google side the uber the the private mobile more sector to predict and compare and if it's it's performing better why not to use it so this is how i see it yeah thank you a great way to sell it too is that you know not only is it greenhouse emissions improvements but that's going to improve efficiency of all travel right so absolutely. if you're really trying to sell to absolutely the and actually uh jody just adding to your point um one of my projects in the phd i applied single and multi-objective eco routing strategies so we routed vehicles from their origins to destination to minimize travel time another scenario to minimize greenhouse gas emissions and another scenario to, uh, to minimize travel time and greenhouse gas emissions what we found is that when we routed vehicles to minimize greenhouse gas emissions we got better performing network in terms of speed in terms of travel time in terms of everything because there is I'm, I'm not sure if you're aware of the diagram or relationship between the greenhouse gas emission on the x-axis and speed here the relation is quasi convex which means that with low speed and high speed emissions are really high so we're looking for this optimal range of speed which is between i think around uh don't quote me on this between 50 miles per hour to 60 or 45 to 55 this is the optimal range so when you route your vehicles to minimize greenhouse gas emissions you're reducing travel time 
So this is really like hitting two birds in a stone. Thank you very much for your comments. Comment. Uh, hello, thank you for your presentation and coming here. So my question is related to, I mean, I have multiple questions, but the more, most important one I have is related to validation process in the yeah. clustering. Yeah. So you uh, you compare the true value with the the cluster predicted value, mm. right? So I was thinking, as far as you add more cluster, your model accuracy should increase. It is increasing. So so that's my my point. So what's what's the point of it? You know. Because we know that as far as we add cluster, it will get better, but you stop at 50 cluster. You know, maybe I want, I'm thinking maybe clustering is not a good approach here. Maybe some other district modeling uh, should be more uh, related here. So what triggered the idea of using clustering in this uh, project is that as we read, we, I was discovering literature and looking at previous studies, we found clustering as a, as a tool, as a, actually a famous tool for prediction. So we wanted to see how is it going to perform in our case. So what you see here is not everything we've done. I assess 20 clusters, I assess 25 clusters. Don't forget that we have a threshold in terms of the computational power that we don't want to exceed, right? It has to be pretty reasonable, doable. So for instance, if you want to run clustering, it may take, let's say, for a large data set. We're talking about, remember, we're talking about 50 data points or data sets. So this is pretty a large uh, data set. So if you want to run it for more clusters, it means, it means that it's going to take a day or two depending on your machine and the, the speed of your machine. So we tested more clusters, but we didn't get what we want. The, to be honest, the, the, the thing that made clustering not a good tool is that it considered greenhouse gas emission rates as a discrete variable. It, the greenhouse gas emission rate should be a continuous variable. As you can see, all values from 2.5 to almost 4, they were either underestimated or overestimated, which is not good for routing, right? It doesn't really reflect the real cost on links. Exactly. That's my idea exactly. that yeah. uh, clustering might not be good uh, or the other method that you use uh, is better fit for prediction. And uh, another question that I have is that you use uh, and if I am uh, right, correct me, or uh, say it's... Uh, so you use all the cor correlation factor mm. to come to see, to select your uh, predictors. Yes. But it is possible that other variable, uh, you, if you see only correlation, you see they are not correlated, but when compared to other, but they are combined with other variables, they might improve your uh, accuracy. I, I just want to know if you tested, so you might have tested and it wasn't. Uh, Allow me to ask you a question now. What is one of the limit or let me let me frame it correctly. Um, I understand that this is, a, it, it, this is a method to look at the correlation and pick the yes, predictor. But there is something related to the network, to LSTM. So what is one of the limitations of LSTM? One of the limitations is that if you increase the number of predictors, or if you have a large number of predictors, it's not going to perform well. Mm. It's not going to give you good results. So we've read a lot of references, and uh, I search in a lot of uh, journal papers and uh, credible resources. We found that we should have a limited number of predictors to maintain the performance of the LSTM network. So this is one of the limitations. And one thing, uh, just going back to clustering, just imagine me here presenting our LSTM networks without comparing to other models. You may be one of the audience members to asking me, have you tested clustering? So as a researcher, I should put, after I've done comprehensive literature review. I found that ARIMA has been mentioned a lot of time. Clustering has been mentioned a lot of time, so I should be considering them and comparing. Maybe, maybe clustering would have been better than other, the other models. So as researchers, we need to see what is there and start to compare reasonably, right? So um, 
This is my answer to you. We should compare. Otherwise, you're going to get an audience and say, have you tested other models? Be prepared. Sure. Thank you for your questions. <laughs> Excellent presentation. Uh, I think you. a lot of good, very good discussion. And I just want to uh, first thank you for coming uh, to give a, a, a this very important topic. And so uh, so my question is, is more uh, high level. Uh, so think about uh, the emission, uh, greenhouse gas emission come from all different places and transportation probably 30, 40 percent contribution. There's a uh, electric power in industry and commercial. Uh, uh, this, so there's a, a lot of different uh, source of the emission. And I know you focus on the roadway, but at the same time on the roadway, they also could be different uh, uh, different uh, land use and different part of that contribute to the emissions. So how how do you accommodate or uh, because we focus on the road, of course, majority are the traffic, but but there's other contribution to that. Absolutely. So how how do you consider those? I think there should be other developed models for that purpose. Uh, looking at the specifications, look looking at the predictors. If you want to follow the same methodology, what are the triggers? Let's say what land use generates more. So we need data. Once we have data, we can create correlation analysis. Think of the best model, and then generate uh, a different model to assess the impact on the produced greenhouse gas emission. Thank you very much for your question, Dr. Lin. I think we have a question from online audience. Yeah, Remy, sure. you raise your hand. You can uh, uh, unmute yourself and uh, ask the question. Yes, hi, doctor. Uh, I, I wanted to know. Oh, hold on, hold on. We, we need to uh, increase the volume. Oh, here, I think Just give is. one second. Is this? Can you hear me now? Hold on. Your volume is just too soft. OK, just wait. Uh, just uh, let me see. Get out of the slides and you can do it on the computer. Thank you. Uh, can you try talk now? Remy? Oh, hello, how is this? Other oh, source. You can yeah, we need to change. Just go here. Go the settings. Setting. Is this better? And here. Hold on, hold on. Hey, please. Ask him to try speaking. Okay, can you try speak now? Hello, can you guys hear me? Oh, uh, yeah, we got it. Okay, ask right, a question. Awesome. Hi, doctor. Uh, I really enjoyed your presentation uh, about like the complex network of downtown Toronto. Is there any other cities uh, with similar complexity that you would like to run the same uh, like modeling or like the same project on? Um, to be honest, what I would think of is maybe expanding the network. Um, so we can, we can mimic what we've done in downtown Toronto to be applied on a similar city like New York or other comparable cities in terms of the characteristics of the network, uh, link length, the dynamic. Um, uh, I'm not really thinking of another um, study area, but I can tell you for sure that you will find a bunch of studies uh, predicting um, greenhouse gas emission on corridors of highways. You will find a lot because it's much easier than an urban, highly complicated network like downtown Toronto or uh, New York or let's say Tokyo or other uh, highly congested urban network. Okay, awesome, thank you. Sure. Okay. I'm happy to answer. That's why I'm here. Uh, another question is related to uh, if you want or have data for other time periods during the day and predict model and mm. compare the accuracy. Mm. Uh, th this is more a suggestion or if you have it uh, already or not. Yeah. You mean if I compare the results from the model with the realistic data? No, no, for other time periods. For example, I think your data is from- uh, 7.45 to yeah. 8 a.m., yeah. which is during the morning peak period. It's a highly congested time of the day. I mean, maybe off peak, period or 
uh, afternoon peak period? Absolutely. This is very important. But to be honest, at that time, I didn't have time to do more. I wanted to ex extend actually the period of my Bayesian optimization, but we had a very strict deadline. So I was like, go Bayesian optimization. I left it for day four days. I had four sleepless nights. I remember very well. <laughs> I did this like five years ago, four sleepless nights, running, 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 and then I got the results. So it's a matter of resources, to be honest, the time, the restrictions, but it's absolutely a good suggestion to compare uh, off-peak with um, with peak hours, different uh, periods of the day, absolutely an added value to the literature. Yes, thank you. I do not see any more questions from online audience. So if no more questions, let's thank our presenter again. Thank you so thank much. You. Thank you. Thank okay. you all for attending. Thank you. Sure. Thank you. Um, thank you for being here. So I'm going to see you next Friday. Okay. Thank you.